Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast is a Christ-centered podcast. Established in 2019 and hosted weekly by Pastor Chris Busher. Addressing a host of topics such as the Great Commission, Christian discipleship, and often featuring interviews with special guests who are experts in their field. The views and events expressed on this podcast and all related materials belong solely to their author and not necessarily to the author's employer, organization, committee, or other group or individual. While all attempts are made to present accurate information, some information may become outdated over time. Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast makes every attempt to timely update any and all such information. Without further delay, here's another powerful episode of Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. Once again, my name is Dallas Montague, and here in the studio today, we have another amazing guest, Russell Cedarberg. Russell, where are you calling from today? Um, I live in uh, Atlantic Beach, Florida, which is just outside of Jacksonville. Um, on the Atlantic coast up by Georgia. Wow. I bet it's beautiful there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Today is a kind of a perfect day, a little overcast, but, uh, we've had some stunning weather lately. So, well, Russell, thank you for being here on our show today. We're going to talk about your books today. I know you have some amazing books released, I think 17 books on Amazon. And today we're going to talk about your book, look behind the mirror. And I'm really excited to talk about this today and share with our listeners a little bit behind this. So again, thanks for being here. You bet. Before we start talking about your book, Russell, I always like to ask our guests to share about their personal testimony. And so I'm going to let you have this time now for the next five to 10 minutes and just share a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, um, I was born in 1952 um, in a Christian family, very conservative uh, in Chicago. Um, the grandson of four Swedish immigrants, um, and they were all saved when they came over. Um, so real solid family. Uh, I was probably saved around age four because I started singing solos in church when I was five years old. Uh, and I, I have distinct memories of singing in church and that I love Jesus at age five. So my walk goes back. I'm almost 69. My walk goes way back. Um, my family broke by mental illness. My mother was diagnosed uh, uh, paranoid schizophrenic when I was 11 years old. Uh, <laughs> a lot of complexity. Um, and it pretty much destroyed our family. So I went through a lot of stuff in my teen years. Um but at a summer camp, uh, I went to summer camp with our church every year, um, twice a year, actually, uh, summer camp and winter camp. And at a summer camp when I was 16, I rededicated my life to Jesus. And it was such a big change for me. It was a remarkable change. Um, <clears throat> um, for when I was young, I went by Russ. Um, I decided at 16, I'm not going to go by Russ anymore because I'm a different person. So I started at that time going by Russell, which is my real name. Anyways, so uh, here I am all these years later and and uh, still uh, walking with God and uh, living in the kingdom and loving the spiritual life. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And Russell, what would be one major thing why you're still a believer today? Why do you still do it after all these years? Um, because God is faithful. Um, so I I knew I'd probably end up with this, telling this story at some point. <clears throat> when I was about uh, 13 years old or 14 years old, I was reading the Bible. I was a very obedient Baptist and did lots of memorization and read, and mostly it was obedience and it wasn't really inspiration. And I was reading and read the verse uh, pray without ceasing and all the, and that was it, it was a profound moment that i still remember um <clears throat> because of course my definition of prayer was you get on your knees and you fold your hands and you close your eyes and you talk out loud and i read that verse and all of a sudden it dawned on me well either what i've been taught is wrong or this verse is stupid and the bible's wrong and it was profound, and it took me a few days, and I thought about that for a long time. And I decided, no, 
I'm going to, to believe the word of God is inerrant. And at a young age, I, I made a hard right turn, and that's what I believed, and that has never changed. And so everything has to line up with the word, and if it doesn't, then I start investigating. I believe the word. I believe I have a very close personal relationship with God. I know Jesus. I know the Holy Spirit. Um, they speak to me. Um, they're intimately involved in my life all the time. So uh, this isn't a matter of obedience as much as it's a matter of relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. Relationship is the key. Amen, brother. Yeah. I really like you, this book. I want to go back into that for a second. Your book, Look Behind the Mirror. And I really love this concept because those of our listeners here today who know some of my testimony, I had a moment in my life where I could not look myself in the mirror and say, I love you. I accept you for who you are, the things that you've done. I couldn't do that in my life. And then I came to a, a breakdown moment with the Lord as well maybe similar to your life, but I said, God, I know who you are. I know who you created me to be. I love you. I love myself. I accept myself. I accept forgiveness and all those things. And that's a whole other episode of the podcast, but it's amazing, this concept. And I have here written what you have. It's what you see when you look in the mirror is most likely not what God sees when he looks at you. And I think that's an important thing to remember today for our listeners. And so I'm really excited to talk about this a little more. Sure. I have some questions for you. And so my first question is. You're listening to the Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. We'll be right back after this quick word from our sponsors. What should have been one of the happiest times in Marcus's life quickly turned into one of the most difficult and trying times. Moving into a new house and having a new baby should have been one of the moments of celebration. But Marcus quickly learned what should have been his promised land was the beginning of his wilderness journey. Life lessons from No Race Drive will inspire, motivate, and draw you closer to God and strengthen your faith. Marcus takes his experiences and breaks them down into 10 life lessons that will help shape your life. Find your copy on Amazon today. Are you tired of wishing and hoping for the miracles that the Bible promises you? Are you looking for answers that will help you discover and unlock the power of God in your life? Miracles Now is a powerful and practical guide to help us walk the path of the normal Christian life in light of the Holy Scriptures. Find your copy of Miracles Now on Barnes & Noble today. I have some questions for you, and so my first question is, First off, how did you write 17 different books? What were the inspiration behind that and <laughs> continuing to author new books? Oh, well, I started writing when I was 14. So my family's wow. really messed up. Um, I have very deep feelings. I have to express them somehow. So I started writing poetry. Poetry turned into songs when I was about 16 because I'm a folk singer, a guitar player. And, and so I was a songwriter for a long time. And so writing, I just became a wordsmith, very in, interested in communication and writing and words and love the English language, you know, 190,000 words in the English language. It's a glorious language for writing. Um, and so I've always been a writer, whether it's short stories, uh, letters, I'm a, a big letter writer. I have pen pals that I write vigorously to. So I express myself by writing. I, I, I record things by writing. I think by writing. So it was kind of a no brainer. Now, um, the, the first book that I wrote, I wrote when I was 33 and it was a young adult fiction book. Um, and that's back in the mid eighties. And I, you know, trying to publish it. I got three offers, but they were all subsidy offers. So uh, it was just too expensive. It's like twelve, fourteen thousand dollars out of my pocket. So I just put it away. Well, when I'm 66 years old, 33 years later, I I thought of the book and I got it out and I downloaded it on my Kindle and read it and. I was shocked it had become a period piece because it takes place in the 90s before cell phones. And so that kicked me off. So 
I mean, this is probably hard to believe, but in the last two and a half years is when I did, when I wrote all the other 16 books. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. So the first book was written at age 33, published at age 66. And then I started writing and I'd been writing for so long and it was so natural for me. And also, I believe there was a, an anointing that came. Um, there was purpose in all of it. So I've got some young adult fiction. There is a, 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 a series of five books. And then there's a series of three books, young adult fiction. And then there's some other fiction. And then there's, you know, Look Behind the Mirror is first in a series of four. That's called Equipping the Bride. So that's been always a super high priority of mine. I travel a lot and do ministry a lot, and it's always about the bride. Mm -hmm. So equipping the bride. Wow. I just did a podcast. I think our last podcast was was talking about the bridegroom and the bride, and it's so it's so good. We need to remember that too, that we are a bride. We are yes. a bride. Men, women, children are a bride of Christ. And it's such a beautiful story that we could take a whole nother hour and talk about. And so thank you. Wow, I'm really impressed of all of your books. And how many Christian books do you have? Just the four for now? All of them have the gospel in them. Mm. Everything. Everything that I write has my, my worldview in it. So as far as nonfiction, there's a testimonial book that has a bunch of testimonies in it. There's a kind of a book of poetry. It's like short sermons, or I don't know what to call it. That's a strange book. And then hmm. there's the four, the four, the book of four series. So there's six total that are nonfiction, technically Christian, and then three on the shelf that I'm working on. Wow. So there's three right now Amazing. that I'm working on. And music. Yeah. Let's talk about music for just a second, because I'm so curious. You release music as well? Yes, sir. I'm I'm working on two records right now. Um a bluegrass worship CD that's all uh, it's all scriptural worship um with bluegrass themes and then I had too many songs there was 24 of them actually. So I decided well the the one that comes after it and I've already started recording some of those songs most of those are also scriptural worship um that would be more appropriate to uh, categorize as folk jazz because it has a lot of sax and trumpet and horns in it so yeah well I'll, you'll have to send me the links for that i'll put that in the description for our listeners to check out as well they can sure. see some of your music some of your books and and just find your whole catalog so sure. amazing all right well russell what led you into writing this book look behind the mirror <laughs> this is a really cool story you'll love this story so um through the pandemic, all through last year, <clears throat> I started running Zoom meetings. I have a Zoom meeting that, that uh, a weekly meeting that lasted a year that takes place in Rome. Most of the people are in Italy. Um, I have another regular meeting that happens in Switzerland because um, I've been to Switzerland a lot. <coughs> Sorry, uh, ministering. And so on the Swiss call, um, so... And, and a, a lot of what we do in those calls is we pray for those countries and we talk about what's going on and blah, blah. Um, on the Swiss call one day, we're talking about our identity in Christ. And one of the Swiss ladies on the call started praying and she prayed in her prayer. And she's English is not her first language. And in her prayer, she said the phrase, um, God help us to look behind the mirror so we can find our our true identity. And it just hit me like a, a a sledgehammer. And I wrote that phrase down, look behind the mirror. Wow, that's profound. That's English as a second language, and she's praying this prayer. And I and I kept looking at the piece of paper on my desk with that phrase on it. A month later, I published the book. <laughs> Wow. Wow. It was just like a download then, just so quick. It was, well, honestly, it's a theme that what I write about in this book 
a lot of the subject matter was already in sermons. I'd already thought about it a lot. I studied about it a lot. So writing it was easy. It, it was really easy. It was really easy. Yeah. Um, because I had a lot to say about it. I have opinions about it. I I <clears throat> understand scripture. You know, half of the book is scripture. Um. So it 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 actually was a really easy. It just fell out. It fell out of my hands onto the keyboard. Since we have you here, we have to understand some of that understanding that you have about looking behind the mirror, about our identity in Christ. So for our listeners today, how do we find our identity in Christ? Well, it's a big topic. That's a huge topic. It's bigger than the book. It, it could be uh, quite a few books, but there is one word that it boils down to. Um, and it's an attitude. It's curiosity. Um, I have found people think that the opposite of love is hate, and it's not. Hate is it is is actually very closely related to love. The opposite of love is indifference, and the opposite of curiosity is complacency. So when I first met my wife. I fell in love with her immediately, and I was really curious. I wanted to spend as much time as possible with my wife so I could get to know her. I want to know more about this gal. So she's, she's awesome. You remember the verse, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Hmm. Right? That's mm -hmm. what that's talking about. And and it is possible, I totally believe it's possible to live because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I believe it's possible and part of the design to live in a state of joy, not happiness, joy. Mm -hmm. And joy promotes curiosity. I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know more about Holy Spirit. I want to know more about Father. I want to know more about Scripture. And it's a curiosity that drives that. Curiosity will drive you to Jesus. It will drive you to learn about who he was historically, what he said, and what he was interested in, because he is my master. He is my mentor. I follow him. I am a disciple of Christ. And if I'm a disciple of Christ, I emulate him. And as I emulate him, he teaches me about who he created me to be. It's it's obviously a big subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the process is actually really simple. Just be curious. Just be curious. Just and if and if you find uh, any complacency in your soul, you dig into your soul. You find complacency. You repent of the complacency and you pray about it. So why am I feeling so lackadaisical in this area? God, reveal this to me. You know, Holy Spirit is really a lot more interested in my growth than I am. Mm -hmm. If I ask him to do something and I give him permission to do something, he's going to do it. He's going to. You know, the Bible says we are transformed daily into the likeness of Christ. So for me, that's like 30,000 days of transformation. And I have to believe that because I have to believe that God is faithful. He does what he says he's going to do. Mm -hmm. Anyways, sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. That's great. And I laughed a minute ago because you said... And when you first met your wife, you had curiosity. And I just told my wife that yesterday. She said something about what's different from when we first got married. And I said, I was so curious about you, you know, and now we've spent every single second together since COVID. So things, I'm not as curious, you know, just of course I am, but just in all that scheme of things. And it's so cool that we can relate that to our relationship with God. Curiosity brings us closer. Hey, hey. I want to know more about you. I want to know more than what I just hear about you because we can hear so many things in the church from other people, but I want to know those secrets that no one else knows, that no one else has told me. That's what I want. I want to spend yep. that secret time with you and understand those things on a deeper level. It's so, so cool. 
And I think you're right, Russell. We could go all day talking about the identity. And just for our listeners who are having a hard time putting their identity in Christ, what's something you could say for us? Well, if you want an accurate measurement, we're only given one measurement in Scripture. You'll know them by their fruit. That's it. That's the ruler we're handed. That is the spiritual ruler that we're handed to measure things with. That's to measure ourselves and that's to measure other people. You'll know them by their fruit. So make a list of what's important to you. This is really important to you. This really angers me. This really makes me happy. This is what I'm really interested in. This is what I spend my money on. This is what I spend my time doing. That's really important. Write down and understand what do I spend my time doing? Because those are the things that I'm interested in. And then go read about Jesus, read the gospels, read them over and over and over and over again, and read them in the context of history. What was Jesus interested in? What was he passionate about? What did he get angry about? And think about that, ponder and ask Holy Spirit to give you revelation on why was Jesus so angry with the religious people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why did he do the thing with the, you know, and it's probably two times, it might even be three times with the making the rope and the money changers. Mm -hmm. Examine those things, apply those things. Am Am I impassioned by the things that Jesus was impassioned by? Is his value system the same as my value system? Mm, That's good. That's good. And the places where you find a big difference, and I ha- I found lots of places over the years where things that were super important to me, I put high value on them. Jesus mm. didn't put any value on it. That's Whoa, so good. That, I preached this play. message a few days ago. That's so good. That's good. <laughs> That's great. That's good stuff. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, talking about our foundation must be Jesus Christ. And if you build anything on the foundation, it's if it's hay or if it's made out of wood or straw, it will be tested by fire. And if it, you're not, it's not going to be successful, of course. And it's, oh, that's so good. And the things we place value on, Jesus does not place the same value on those things. And I think you're so right. If we really take that phrase, look behind the mirror in our life and all these things, take account of the things we're doing, spending our money on. You got it, Russell. That's awesome. That's so good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And for our audience as well, what do you think is the biggest thing that they can get out of this book? I I doubt that there's anyone who can read the book who won't at least be stirred, their curiosity stirred a little bit, just a little bit. So I've been ministering in church churches for since about 19 since the late 60s that's a long time i visited lots of churches i've preached in a lot of churches um i always ask people uh the two questions who are you and what do you have what's your identity who are you and what are your gifts what are your spiritual gifts and i say normally about 90 percent of evangelical Christians that I run into do not have a clue mm-hmm. about either one of those things. Yeah, that's so sad. It is. It's like we're missing out on the gifts of God and uh, the, who we're supposed to be, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm going to read two sentences out of my book. In the very beginning, it says this, that it has been said that in a war, if your enemy can convince you that you are weak, you have already lost. If the enemy of our souls can convince us that we are something far less or something quite different than what we really are, his work is practically complete. He doesn't need to do anything else. He doesn't need to tempt us. He doesn't, he's already sidelined us. Most Christians are sidelined. I saw this yesterday in a a real situation where we were doing evangelism here. And Russell, I didn't tell you this, but I'm living in Brazil right now as a missionary. And so yesterday we went out to do missions. And one one woman in particular asked us to pray for her womb to be open because she was praying for a baby, trying to have a baby, but she was not married. And so that's a whole other situation that we, we try to speak with her and help her understand. 
But she, from her perspective, is that she needed to clean herself first before she spent time with God, before she went to the church. And I was like, no, 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 no. You're totally missing it. It's not about you cleaning yourself and then going to Jesus. Go to Jesus and he will clean you. That's the thing. And I think that's exactly what you're trying to say there. And it's it fits so perfectly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it fits perfectly. It fits perfectly. People, people are loaded down with shame. They're loaded down with guilt their 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 measurement of themselves is completely off most people are totally off about themselves most people don't feel like they have permission to do anything nothing well i haven't been trained well i don't have a degree i'm not a pastor mercy you know what would you say is the biggest mistake that people make searching for their identity in Christ. I know that we're just talking about it a little bit right now about having that shame and guilt, but what's something else that you've seen that people do? Uh, this is a big deal. This is another book, actually. It's a really big deal. Hmm. People make assumptions. They see people in front. They see things, and actually part of this is in another book. They see the way somebody else does something, and they think, that's the only way that it can be done. You see an evangelist evangelizing people. That's the way it's done. But I, I don't know how to do that, so I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. And so they make this assumption that because, because this guy, this, the, the guy who teaches my Sunday school class has a Ph.D. in church history, and he's brilliant at dissecting scripture and but i can't do that because i don't even have a college degree so i'm not going to do anything i'm not going to even bother studying i'll just listen to what he says he's much smarter than me he's more gifted than me he's more talented than me yeah that's a dangerous trap it's dangerous it's dangerous because we're all created completely unique there is nobody in the world dallas who can do the job that you're doing as well as you're doing it. Nobody. And if you suddenly believe that, well, I really don't have qu the qualifications to do this, this blog, this, you know, these interviews, I, I'm not qualified, and you stop. Somebody, God will bring somebody else along to do the job, but the person that comes along is not going to be as good as you doing it like what you're you. called to do. That's good. We are mm -hmm. all that way. That's why I love Acts chapter four. They were common and uneducated men, but they could tell that they had been with Jesus. That's my goal. I just want people to look at me and say, hey, he has been with Jesus. That's it. And I'm telling you, <clears throat> there are two, I say this all the time. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who are looking for truth and there are people who are not interested in truth. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, maybe it's 50-50. I, I just don't know. In my experience, um, it's not 50% that are interested in truth. Mm, unfortunately, less. less probably, yeah. But mm -hmm. for the people who are interested in truth, I don't care where they start. They can start anywhere. And I got a whole book full of stories about people starting in the strangest places. If they're looking for truth, what does Jesus say about himself? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. If you're looking for the truth and you're diligent about it, you are going to find Jesus, no matter what. And living that different way than the world, it'll raise others' curiosity. And that'll Bingo. bring them to look behind the mirror as well and experience Jesus in a way that's so good. I've had so many ministry opportunities in the strangest places because my wife and I travel a lot. We lived in Sweden for a year and a half, and you know we lived in UK for six months. Um, and, and no matter where we go, grocery store, restaurant, pub, it doesn't matter. We sit down, somebody comes over, we have a discussion, we talk about God. Because they can see that there's something different. And I've been in really dicey situations. You know, I've been in, in Stockholm, no-go zones where the police won't even go. Filled with, it's all Syrians and all militant. And I, you know, walk into a pizza place, sit down, order a pizza, and 
immediately two people are sitting at my table half an hour later we're laughing and talking and having a great conversation and it's because of what you just said they can tell something is di- well something's different about this guy hmm. something i i want to find out and i make myself approachable i open myself up mm-hmm. i don't close myself off i don't wear dark sunglasses and look away i look at people right in the eyes and I smile at them and I invite them with my personality to come and talk to me. And they do all the time, all the time. I think that's a huge, that's a huge evangelistic tool. Also, like you say, (laughs) being available, being available. It's so simple. Yeah. Yeah. I've met so many Christians who are not available and I've met so many non-Christians who are available. And I really think that's why Jesus hung out with sinners is because they were available, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's it's. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think you're right. I think super interesting. So many times in our Christian circles, we we close the doors, we close the walls, or who who's allowed in, Come who's on. not allowed in, and we we judge who's in and out. Yeah, I'll hang out with anybody, anybody. I don't care who it is. I'll hang out with anybody until they get mean. Mm-hmm. Most people, you hang out with them, and you you. You look for ways to encourage them. And when you start encouraging somebody, when you start seeing into the soul of a person and and encouraging them, giving them encouraging words, that, and this is a whole book about prophecy, th- they're not going to go away. They're hungry. People are really, really desperately hungry. Hmm. I was just telling my wife a few days ago, about that same thing. When you're going to do evangelism, when you're, and like you said, prophecy as well, seeing people the way that Jesus sees them, seeing them through the eyes of God instead of what they look like on the outside, it's it's so huge in evangelism. Because if you go with that, you, of course, you know this, I'm preaching to the choir, but if you go with that prejudice in your heart, this person has weird hair, this person wears weird clothes, this person has earring tattoos, or this person doesn't believe in God, they're a witchcraft, an atheist, whatever, you're out, the door's closed. The door's closed. You're never going to reach that person for Christ. I'll tell you what I did. Um, I caught myself back in the 90s. I, I had a sales route, and I would drive around town a lot, and I would, you know, in my van driving around, and I'd see people, and I would, well, there's a tall person. There's a fat person. There's a skinny person. There's a homeless person. And suddenly, Holy Spirit one day arrested me. He whacked me upside the head, and he said, you shouldn't be doing that. And so I started praying. Every time I would do that, I would pray out loud, God, show me their hearts. Show me their hearts. So 20 times a day for three years. <laughs> and I'm telling you, three years later, my eyes had been opened. So now when I look at people, I can see the outside, but I see into their soul. I, I look and I pray it all the time now. I never stopped praying that prayer. Show me their hearts. I want to see the inside. I want to see the calling. Mm-hmm. You know, we're given gifts and callings when we're born. God calls us by name in the womb. And the, the gifts and the callings are irrevocable. They're, they're without repentance, the word says. I want to see that stuff because that's the stuff that people are unaware of. If the devil can keep that stuff out of my vision, if he can keep me ignorant about my calling and my gifts, the things that God gave me and my true name, if he can keep me ignorant of that stuff, he doesn't have to do anything else. And I want to tell people about that stuff. So I do it all the time, everywhere I go. I go to the doctor. The doctor's visits for me are a chance to prophesy over the doctor. I once had a dentist break out in tears and look at me and say, Russell, you've made me a better dentist. It's the greatest compliment I've ever gotten in my life. And this is a secular dentist. Because every time I went, I would look at her and I'd ask Holy Spirit, give me something to encourage her with. Every time. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. This is in the book. And it's so beautiful to use our gifts for what we're called to do. And my last question for you today, we can wrap it up with this, is what would you say to someone who says, Russell, well, I don't know what my gifts are. I don't have any gifts. What would you say to that person? Um, We can't discover things on our own. There has to be covenant relationship in your life, not just with Holy Spirit, with other people. 
You have to find people who will feed you, who will encourage you, who will support you, who have no ulterior motives. You have to find people. And sometimes those people are secular. I had a, in Stockholm once, I had a, a heroin addict on the street prophesy to me and tell me something about myself. And I knew it was God speaking to me. It totally encouraged me. Well, I'll tell you what, the next day that heroin addict was delivered from heroin addiction and was saved. And he brought his his roommate, who was also a heroin addict, in, and the, the roommate got saved and, and delivered, too. Wow. Wow. Community is really important. Yeah. It, it all happens in the context of connection. Mm -hmm. All of it. Yeah. Well, Russell, thank you so much for your time here today. Check out this book, Look Behind the Mirror. The link is below. And if I can have you in this podcast today with a prayer, I would really appreciate it, Russell. Absolutely. Father, I just thank you for Dallas. I th thank you for his ministry. I thank you for the gifts that you've given him and the passion that you've given him to pursue this like very few people are willing to pursue. And I ask Holy Spirit that you bless him right now. You bless him. You bless him. You bless his finances. You bless his efforts. You bless his dreams. You bless his visions. Give him visions, heavenly visions. Give him heavenly dreams. Excite his imagination. Let him know that there's more, and then there's more, and then there's more. And I ask Holy Spirit that everyone listening to this podcast would get the same thing, that they would ask you for more. They would ask you for revelation. And of course, Father, you're going to do it. You're a faithful God, and we love you, and we worship you, and we bow down to you, and we yield our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You've just listened to the Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast with your host, Pastor Chris Busher. Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast was recorded live in studio with final editing made before uploading. Subscribe today to Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast on iTunes or Google Play. For more fantastic daily content, visit Pastor Chris Busher online via Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Don't miss the next episode on Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast.